Hello and welcome back. We're back again with Sebastian for a Q&A session. How are you doing? Good. All right. Excellent. Good seeing you. I'll start with uh, a question on general artificial intelligence. So DARPA shared a recent video um, on their perspective on artificial intelligence where they talk about the three waves of AI. Can you comment on building tools and techniques that will come in handy for designing context-aware AI? First of all, I have to embarrassingly say I was actually part of the second wave because hopefully you guys are just part of the third wave, which is much, much better. Uh, but yeah, so there's been um, a discussion about what tools to use. And for a long time, AI was very rule-based. The idea was to go to an expert and solicit information and talk to them and write it down as ifs and else rules. And that looked like the most scalable approach. This came out of the 1980s. Ed Feigenbaum invented expert systems. And I think the first successful commercial application of AI were these rule-based expert systems. Mm -hmm. People tried to scale this up to something of human intelligence. Um, there's a project called the Psych Project, C-Y-C, that spent more than two decades actually trying to really put large rules together. And what people found is these rules have all loose ends. They, they can't really connect them. You have an entity over here, it's called a car, entity over here called a vehicle. And a car is not exactly a vehicle because a vehicle could also be a bicycle, but maybe in this context it's meant to be a vehicle. And it was really hard to make these rules work together. And then of course came the most recent super exciting machine learning era of AI. And with that, we tossed everything else overboard. So there's no search, no planning, no rules, no logic. AI can't read books anymore and stuff like that. So it's very fair to say that the future is probably somewhere in between. And the nice thing about research is it comes in, in, in like a pendulum. It swings. Like it goes from rules to learning to rules to learning. Mm -hmm. And as we do, we make progress. Uh, so my suspicion is in the next 10 years, people will find ways, for example, to build general purpose AI, they can do multiple domains, and then use more maybe logic-based or rule-based um, um, information to feed these systems, not just data points. Right, so the future lies in bringing together the best of both worlds. That I believe. I mean, the, the proof is, of course, in the pudding. We have to see how far learning carries us. I would argue humans uh, vastly learn from data. Uh, we spend the first couple of years like babbling and falling over. But eventually, we learn by rules. Like if you go as a college student, and people give you rules. Uh, but it takes a lot of prior learning to make these rules in process. And then the rules aren't very good. So when, for example, you look at self-driving cars, the rules defining how to behavior, behave in, in streets have um, inconsistencies. They, they, they would lead to complete traffic shutdown if followed verbatim in many, many cases. Uh, and then people have to improvise. So I don't think we understand how to represent these kind of soft rules powerfully in a, in a learning context yet. Okay, cool. Our next question is from Mario. Um, he asks, how do I go from training an agent on my local machine to actually having something deployed in production or in a mobile app? Well, you take the mobile app uh, Udacity Nano Degree. We have an Android and an iOS. Um, and what you find is that the training is much more complex and time consuming than the use. Mm -hmm. So if you Train a neural network, it might take weeks to train, and then running it might take milliseconds. And the reason is for training, you have to iterate many, many, many times to data points over and over again, whereas in running it, you just take a single sweep. Uh, so in principle, it's not very hard. For Android, uh, Google has made its software available. Um, you can do deep learning on, or deep, run deep learning networks on Android very easily. And I, I just recommend download it and, and play with that. Cool. Let's move on to some questions from logic and planning. Mm -hmm. um, here's one from Morgan. Can you uh, give us some examples of uh, companies that are using planning systems? For instance, maybe healthcare or other industries that are using planning systems. It really depends on how we define planning. I mean, there's this entire domain of job shop scheduling where you have a uh, facility that manufactures something and you bring things in, like for example, a car factory, and you find, oh, my supplier number X has a problem, uh, the product number Y isn't good enough, uh, there was a truck accident, and the entire truck shitload full of these things over here are delayed. This machine just broke down. And then you have to take a schedule, which is a plan, and adjust it. And these things are very commonly used in the industry, there's no question. Um, if you go even further, if you look, for example, into, into chip design, uh, the type of methods that are being used to, to test complex chips are very similar and, and came out of artificial intelligence uh, to constraint satisfaction systems, which are very related to planning system. Uh, here again, you have this complicated problem that 
you might have a really complicated chips with like billions of transistors, you can't test every state, but you want to have an effective way to find defects in your chip. Mm -hmm. So if you take planning to be this broad view, I think it's very successful. If you take planning to be the narrow view that, has, that you have to um, write on your clauses in logic and then do logical inference, I think this stayed more of an academic exercise and hasn't really made it as big in the industry. Mm, that's interesting. Here's, an, uh, here's a question related to that. So Varuna asks, nowadays there is a lot of hype about chatbots and virtual assistants. Um, can we use a large knowledge base with efficient logic and planning algorithms to create a sound chatbot? Or is it better to use a more statistical approach for such applications? As in all those questions, I don't know the answer. And you can go and figure it out for me and tell me because research is nonlinear and sometimes things surprise a lot. However, if you look, for example, in the way Watson was designed and many chatbots are designed, I would say large statistical techniques have a leg up. And the reason is language is not quite as logic as Chomsky originally anticipated it. Uh, while it feels that there's very clear grammatical rules that we use, those tend not to be sufficient to understand what a good chatbot is, especially when it comes to meaning of words and use of words and humor and all these wonderful things. Whereas the world is full of data. Um, so if I were to build one, I just find myself a big database and just run statistics over it, very simple statistics. But having said this, it is quite feasible in the future someone comes up with a very good rule-based system. That system has to be robust, very, very robust. So it can be very static the way rule-based systems are mostly today. Cool. So in uh, term two of AIND, we'll be teaching them some more statistical approaches, but with the fundamentals of uh, natural language. Yeah, and there's an interesting uh, history to it. Um, there was a gentleman named Peter Brown at, at IBM at the time about 20 or so years ago, um, who really looked into uh, machine translation, which is not chatbots. It's more like you have a Canadian text and an English text and you want to translate those. And back to in the day, all the linguists in the world believed that you had to write a rule-based system. And they were writing these rule-based systems and they're testing them for accuracy and they basically got nowhere. And this IBM group under Fred Danilik decided to instead statistically parse text that is available in English and French. And they found in the Canadian d debates, because Canada is duolingo, the, the parliamentary debates were meticulously translated by high quality human translators. And there is a huge corpus of data where almost word by word that the French and the English. And by just training a very simple statistical bigram model on this text, they were able to surpass anything possible at the time. Which led Fred Jelinek, who was the head of the team, proclaim at the time, every time I fire a linguist, the performance goes up by 5%. <laughs> That's, that's amazing. I mean, that's, that could be a good exercise for uh, our students to try out to replicate those results. Yeah, and what's interesting uh, too is this entire speech group eventually left IBM and became Renaissance Capital. You can read up on it. It's the very secretive investment group that often brings 70% or so in annual returns, which is crazy. And they're using similar, very advanced statistical techniques. No one knows exactly what, but they were built on this idea of statistical as opposed to rule-based. Wow. That's cool. Morgan has another question. Um, what is the current state of the art in using neural nets to perform planning or to provide heuristics for it? There has been a lot of work in the past on using neural networks in the process of things like game playing and so on. And it comes in basically in two fashions. Uh, one is um, the evaluation function. When you, when you do search in games, at some point you're going to say this board is this good. Um, that was done early on by TD Gammon by Tesaro and it's been a big component of uh, the most recent AlphaGo system. Um, and then the second one is, is the order in which you search. If you get into alpha beta search, you find out that the order in which you expand is massively impacts the computation. And ever since I was a grad student, people wrote theses on this. Um, that is, these learning components play important roles. If you look into specific game playing, um, like two-way rule-based game playing, like chess and so on, there is a very deep uh, planning engine behind all of these systems, no matter how complex they are. But the learning part is the one that makes it scale. Cool. Here's one from Ho Chin Chi. Um, if you've heard of the recent upcoming robo race, think like F1 racing for uh, self-driving cars. Um, planning and speed are both going to be very important in there. So the question is, should driverless racing cars plan ahead of time to obtain an optimal route? Or should they train while navigating the course and slowly increase the speed over time? Again, this question doesn't have a binary answer because in the end of the day, with infinite compute power, say, then you might be just fine off planning on the spot. Um, however, at Google, our cars, when I ran the team, had a pre-planned route. 
-hmm. And the P-plan round was not just planned, it was also optimized. So we would have algorithms that would like at the, the terrain infrastructure, the, the roads and so on, and find a good way to do a turn, for example, to intersection. And mm -hmm. occasionally, our human safety drivers would say, this is really odd, can I please build it outside? And then humans would go and, and move these things a little bit around. Not optimal, but scalable. Mm -hmm. um, then for the Google car, the evasion maneuvers are very small. Like you might pass a car, you might nudge around a bicyclist. And those tend to basically result in lateral shifts along your, your roadway. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're not very complex. However, if you really want to go into a complex world, you might actually try to plan from scratch and really write on the principles of physics. Uh, just be aware this is going to be a lot of work, <laughs> uh, especially in real time. The real time part is hard because as you plan and you go in a race car, I don't know, 30, 40 meters per second, and you spend a second planning, you will be surprised what your car will do with you. That's, that's very good advice. <laughs> All right, we'll wrap up with some questions from probabilistic models, probably one of your favorite areas. So Atula asks, in base nets and HMMs, we define a model by specifying states and transitions between them. How do we come up with these states? Do I always need to handcraft these states for my model? Yeah, I would argue the states of an HMM, or a common filter, whatever you call it, is kind of the most difficult thing to do. The filters themselves uh, are based on an assumption, it's called conditional independence, or you could also call it the noise is independent, right? So when a robot drives on a corridor, it might slip to one side, and uh, the next moment it moves, it might slip to the other side completely independently. But the reality is they're never independent. So in carpet in particular, it turns out if you drive a robot on a carpet, most carpet stands like this and has a falling direction. So it falls in this direction, which means if the carpet falls in this direction, the robot will always drift in this direction, no matter what. So there is state. The state is now, uh, how did the carpet installer install the carpet, right? Is the falling direction this direction or this or this, north, south, south, You could estimate this. And before you realize, you have this like 10,000 dimensional state vector. And then someone, maybe your grad student, has to write down all the rules how the state behaves. It's really hard, the physics of the carpet. Uh, so what we do in, in robotics is we take the most important states. And the reality is the biggest challenge in designing these filters and HMMs and similar is to come up with a good state representation where these assumptions are met. In physical systems like rockets or planes or self-driving cars, at least you have a semantic with those states. You know exactly um, what, uh, for example, velocity is, what an acceleration is, what a uh, dry, gyro drift rate is, if you like. But if you go to um, natural language processing, then often these things are kind of crippled to begin with. You don't even know what the state is of a human brain. There's no physical thing that uh, governs how, uh, for example, Sebastian mispronounces every second word in, in this video, right? But it certainly is there. There's a Sebastian state that has an uh, effect on, on, on my ability to speak proper English, which is not very good, right? Um, so, so then things become even more fuzzy. And then um, to some extent, your learning, learning algorithms can mask over this. Uh, if there's hidden dependencies and suboptimal choices, they adapt to it. But again, I think the choice of state is the single most demanding thing in the design of these algorithms. Interesting. So in addition to the choice of states, um, another factor is, for instance, the choice of features or observations that you want to um, observe in order to model your um, you know, HMMs, for instance. So how do you go about deciding what features to use? There's been a big debate in the field between features. So uh, statistically, uh, historically, um, no more than five. Uh, because uh, six-dimensional Gaussians, we can have hard to prove stuff. Um, and the most recent wave is the opposite. Take 50,000 features and then pepper this thing with data so they let the data figure out what features make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an open debate. Um, it's a very passionately uh, conducted debate in the field. Um, when people use very large feature spaces, they often add in regularizers. They try to cramp down on those and arrive at a few of those to avoid what's generally called the bias variance dilemma. Mm -hmm. uh, but all the data in deep learning today contradicts almost everything we know about statistics. Uh, so people are now willing to take very large feature sets like high-res images and still learn interesting functions. Okay. That brings us to our last question today. Um, Abhinav asks, could you provide some insights into when HMMs perform better compared to recurrent neural networks? So HMMs work generally better when what you model is close to how the world really works. If you, for example, uh, do a gameplay where you flip coins and you know exactly that the coin you flip is random and the next coin you pick up is conditioned on the point you saw before or whatever, then, and you can write on these kind of laws of physics, so to speak, it was of a game, then HMS do really, really well. 
Um, HMMs do badly if you have amorphous, unspecified data. And that's exactly where the difficulty comes in speech recognition and the recent advances. So HMM have never done well, in my opinion, on complex video processing because video art is so, so, so complicated. Like you, you can't really write down the physics of all the rendering in the world and all the cats in the world and how they behave mm -hmm. to really have a good model of what the cat is going to do next. Um, unfortunately, you can't. Um, and we, as we know, cat videos are the most popular videos of all of, of all videos ever taken on, on YouTube. Um, so the recurrent networks, I think, fit better into the other category. Now they have way too many parameters. So mm -hmm. if you have very sparse in parameters and uh, in, in, in data, if you have very, very sparse in data, then um, be careful with recurrent neural networks. They might just get stuck. And they can learn stra strange, crazy things. My very first conference paper I ever wrote was called Inversion in Time. And it trained the recurrent neural networks to do digital recognition. Wow. And then it looked what other stuff is being recognized as a five or as a six. And it turns out, if you do gradient descent in the input space, you find crazy shit that these networks recognize as a perfectly formed five. And that is probably the weakness of recurrent networks, that there might be some crazy input constellations that to you and me look like noise, but for some whatever reason, this trained neural network wow. recognizes something it knows. That's amazing. That's, that's a good thought to end on. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> it's a total pleasure. Okay. And I'll see you guys in classroom. Keep it up. Great questions. Thank you.